Hey, I'm Matt Hudgens, and he's Dave Mulvaney, and this is Profitability MD. Dave, how you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great, Matt. How about you? Good. It's a nice spring day. Enjoying a little spring weather. I even have a little short sleeve shirt on. I didn't even dress up for you today. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. And you had your uh, you had your par round last week, so that's right. That's right. That All is good in the world. That was um, that was just yesterday after work. Yeah. Okay. There you go. All, all is good. But that's exceeding expectations. Don't tell anybody because I got a, a match this weekend and I still need strokes. <laughs> all right episode episode 165 never too early to start never too early to start okay so what do we mean by that never too early to start and and i think you said that before maybe in our last podcast right best time to uh grow an oak tree was 10 years ago the next best time is today right the next best time is today right so you can always second guess i wish i wish i could have would have could have should have second best time is right now so this came out of some conversation i've had this week when he talks about never too early to start your four pillars, right? Your four pillars, we talk about this all the time. Your business, your business generates income to use that income to support your lifestyle. Then it needs to generate income so you can buy real estate, revenue producing real estate. So then you could uh, start a retirement plan. So you can put money away, pre-tax, tax benefits, retirement plan. And then number four, you can have wealth accumulation accounts. So you can use that money to buy other businesses, other real estate, stocks and bonds, kind of the, the, the wealth accumulation part. So there's four of them. Never too early to start. And so where this came out of was, so I have uh, one of my uh, clients who's talking about selling his business. Well, no matter what kind of business, but start selling his business. And so when you have uh, start selling these businesses, a lot of times they make an offer that is, we're going to buy your business, we're going to give you money, and then you're going to have to work here for one year, three year, five years. They call that an earn out. You're going to wait. Okay. And then when they make that offer, they say, you know, you as I said, I'm going to give you $2 million today, and then I'm going to give you 300000 a year for the next five years, just using those kind of numbers. That's $1.5 million. So they're going to tell you, plus the $2 million, they're going to say, hey, I'm going to give you $3.5 million. Well, they're not giving you $3.5 million today. They are giving you $2 million today, and then the rest is $300,000 a year of your own salary, right? This guy would have made 600000 He makes it, he has a nice business himself. So he's got his same job. He got $2 million today, but now he's making half as much as he did. Yeah, and he's got to pay tax on the front end of that first $3 million too. And he, and, he, and he has tax on the $3 million, which is 20%. Depends if you own the real estate in there, 25%. And you got no business uh, advantages of being the business owner. We've talked about explaining on a previous episode. So your 300000 is now taxed as ordinary income of the W-2, whereas your business income, you get it right off. You know, Oh, you go into your whatever, your entertainment your travel because you're going to conventions and all that. We talked about tax benefits. So now, can I ask a question about that? Like what yeah. you think about, because when you were talking about him being a W-2, um, my recommendation would be that he works as a um, a consultant, as an independent on that 300,000 that. so that he that. would then get the self-employment benefits and the deductions so that he could keep more of the 300,000 potentially. That's a great point. If, if you were going to, say yes to that type of transaction, I'd recommend that you're paid outside of a W-2 rather than inside of it. Yeah, you could be an independent contractor. And so they're hiring you to work for three years, five years. You have an employment contract, you're an independent contractor. In which case you're exactly right. Then they can pay you your 300 grand and you get to write off your own expenses. You know, you still get to travel and you've got your car and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great way to do it. Yeah. But the interesting thing about that, so, or you could just not sell it, you know, work for five years, making, in his case, 600000 a year. And then at the end of five years, you sell it, right? And which one are you better off? So there's this thing in my mind immediately, like if I were consulting this person, I'd say, look, work the five years, live off the 300, because you weren't going to spend yeah. the 2 million anyway. That's right. So That's right. Take 300 and move it to the next pillar. Yes. Here, move it to the next pillar. And start getting cash flow out of the other pillars. Then that is exactly right. Is that where you were going with this? That's where exactly where I was going with that. That's exactly where I was going with that. But never too early to start, right? So at the end, what ends up happening, and, and these numbers might be too big. I'm just using this as an example, and nobody in particular, yada yada yada. So there's no confidential information, nothing like that. But yeah, then out of that, the two million dollars plus the salary, is that enough for him, him to really live off of, right? Because you put that in, typically in a stocks and bond portfolio and you're only supposed to spend four or five percent of that. So that's really, is that enough for you to live off of, right? That's really what happens. Just like you sold a piece of real estate, right? So you're a real estate guy and 
a lot of times you have this real estate you bought and it's appreciated, but it's generated a nice cash flow for you. If you sell the real estate, you've got to pay tax on it. And then it's got to generate the same amount of cash as what it was before you sold the piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of real estate guys don't like to sell their real estate. Right? So if you sell, if you have a million dollar piece of real estate and the cap rate is 3%, meaning it's making you $30,000, right? You would have to go, but when you sell the million dollars, you're only going to get 25%, 750,000. Now in order for 750 to generate 30,000, that's like a seven and a half percent return. If I'm doing my mouth on the top of my head, right? So it's like, well, crap, maybe I shouldn't sell it. It sounds like a great to have a million dollar building, but then I only end up with 750. And then by the way, I got to replace that 30,000 in income. Real estate guys go through this all the time. But if he, okay, if you took it, okay, so let's just say uh, you bought, took your 300,000 every year. And this is a good discussion to have. You took 300,000. I'm going to go buy a $1.2 million piece of property. I'm going to borrow the money. I'm going to leverage. I'm going to take 300,000 and use leverage. So that's 75, 25. So now you're, my recommendation would be only buy something that's cash flowing, positive cash flow every month. And, and you're going to get that. Yes, well, over a five-year period of time, you're going to accumulate almost $6 million of property. You're going to have yes. a million five. And if you raise the rents by about five to 10% a year, what's going to happen is investment real estate is all based on cap rate. Now you've probably actually the $6 million worth of property you have is probably now worth about eight. And if you then sell um, much of that um now you sell the business and you got this big chunk in hand, you could either pay down the real estate or you could sell all that real estate as a package and do a 1031 exchange and buy something bigger that gives you yep. more cash flow. And you could even take some of the, you could keep the 2 million or, or put it into the cash, investing cash flow, it cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. I mean, you still yes. have an asset base and hopefully you fully funded your retirement and all of that. But I think, there's not enough uh, thought process that goes into, into the real estate. <laughs> you want the most amount of real estate you can get with the least amount of labor. Right. So I wouldn't recommend buying single family homes, single family homes. You know, you could, you could buy a house that'll give you a thousand cash flow. Great. It's all fine and good until the toilet leaks or the air conditioner, air conditioner breaks that happens, but you want to buy assets that you can, that have enough cash flow to pay people to maintain them. Yeah, so, so you, can, you don't have to do it. So, but my point being is never too early to start, right? Exactly. He's in a situation right now where he doesn't have all that stuff. Your, your recommendation is exactly what I told him, which is you don't spend all the money you make right now. Why don't you spend that excess money building up your four pillars, buying your office building, buy other revenue producing pieces of real estate, which you may or may not sell, or it might provide the income. Because the average business owner already, so let's back up. The average business owner is already running fifty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars of personal expenses through the business. And what I mean by that is, you probably got your cell phone on the business. You probably got your laptop and your iPads that are going through the business. You probably got some travel because you go to a convention that happens to be in Colorado, and then you stayed a couple of days and went skiing, or you had a convention down at the beach and you happened to stay a couple of days after the beach, right? So a lot of business owners, most business owners are running a large amount of stuff through their business. They don't realize it. All that would have to come out of the money that you got paid for, right? To, for somebody to buy your business, it goes back to tax benefits of being an owner. But really the whole point of this was never too early to start would be, yeah, so you haven't built the pillars, but you are in a situation where you could turn down this offer and use the next five years, exactly like you said, to start building your pillars, right? And we can super fund a retirement. They got these things called defined benefit plans, which are like Mac Daddy on top of 401ks. You put that in place where you save a bunch of money, $200,000, $300,000 a year pre-tax. You could buy your office building. You could buy some other office buildings as well. Boom, boom, boom. You could have a little five-year plan. And then at the end of five years, selling your business would be gravy on top of that, right? It, it'll be a nice bonus when you sell it for $2 million or $3 million bucks because you don't, you don't get the trail because you're not staying on, you know? be great, but, but you built it over the next five years, right? And, and the, the flip side of that might be um, during those same five years, you also, you know, work with somebody like you or, you know, like us so that we can help you make that a more self-managing business so that right. you may not have to sell it. Maybe that business can operate without you. Maybe you, maybe you take a, 
let's say you're you're a doctor and you take on a a young partner out of you know out of college and you say look i i can transition you into like running this business in the next five years but i'll bring you in we'll start you at a you know at a, at a good salary but not a great salary you know but you'll be a partner in in five years from now um I'll oversee the business and you'll be the, you'll be the number one physician. And then you could bring in a second person to, to fill in my shoes. And now your, pra your practice is growing without like, so now you don't have to sell. And once again, you can keep pulling money out um, and putting it into your other pillars. And so uh, exactly right. I literally had that same conversation uh, yesterday or Monday with one of my lawyers, right? So it's a lawyer. He's got a, a one junior lawyer. He could easily have a second junior lawyer and start farming out more of his caseload to the two of them. Now his caseload could be 25% of what it was. So he'll get paid on his workload, right? If he, if he figured out the lawyers get paid based on what they do business with, but then there's an override that he would get on, on top of that. So he can reduce his law practice where he didn't have to do the work. He's got two junior lawyers doing the work. Now he's working 25%. Right now it's probably 70, 30. He's only got one lawyer. He's doing 70%. The other guy's doing 30%. Hire a second guy. And I bet you could get it where they're doing 70% between the two of them and you're doing 30, 25 to 30%. So you've now freed up a bunch of your time, but you're probably making almost the same amount of money because these two guys, Yes. right? This, Talk about self-managing. This is a law firm. but This is, uh, this is where most people, um, solopreneurs, and, and this can be doctors, lawyers, dentists, uh, professionals, um, accountants, what, where they don't realize what they think is, okay, if I give half my practice to someone else, I'm going to take <coughs> and cut and pay. And so they're thinking, maybe I don't want to do that. What really happens is um, that person makes you more effective. And then immediately your practice grows to fill in that, that space. By the time you put the third person in, you're probably working, like you said, 30% as hard as you ever were. So you're hardly working, but your income is probably higher now because in, in, you know, in investing in real estate, you get leverage. You don't get that in the stock market. But in your own business, when you invest in employees and, and partners, you get leverage. So this is the way you leverage your business is by inserting people into the equation so that they can make your job easier, you're more effective, you do your A-plus activities, and boom, your business is bigger now, and it's more valuable, because it doesn't need yeah. you. It doesn't need you. Well, it's funny you said that. So, so there's some creative things you could do along those same kind of lines. And let's go back to it. Literally, we do this with, with, with dental practices. Let's use an example. So you're a dentist, you're a one-man dentist, you've got your hygiene, and blah, 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 blah. And you think, I'm going to hire an associate, exactly, I'm going to get cut. But... What you can do and what we've done before structured deals this way, which is, okay, this is my practice, right? This is my dental practice. And I'll pay you to help me. That's kind of a salary. But all new patients will split 50-50. So I'm really making you a partner, quote unquote, because it's actually phantom equity. It's not real equity of all the new growth. So it's kind of like, I'm going to make what I make over here. And I'm paying you like an associate to help me. But you're also building equity, you, Mr. Associate, you know, you're building equity over here. And you and I are splitting the new business 50-50. So it's a neat model. So then you never had to take the, the, the step back, right? You're exactly right. A lot of people think I got to bring on and I'm taking a step back and I'll never make it back. But your point is, even if you took the step back, you'll probably make it back. My point was you could even get more creative, which is you take a very little step, but you offer a bigger piece of equity on the front end instead of offering them a third of your business or half your business here, you're only offered a half of the new stuff, right? So it's an interesting way to kind of never have to take, only take a smaller, you know, and sometimes you gotta take a little small step back, but it only has to be a small step back to go bigger forward. Yeah, and here's the other thing that that younger, I, and I, I hate to say younger because, you know, there's all no, that, right. but a younger associate, you bring somebody in and um, maybe you're in your, you know, mid, late fifties or what have you, and, and this person is in their early thirties. Well, the one advantage that person in their early 30s has is they're probably better on social media. And so now your ability to grow, this person is a, we'll call it a quasi partner. Um, this, this partner you have realizes I've got to grow my practice. And in order to do that, 
hey, Bob, we need to improve our social media. And you're like, what social media? You know, it's I thought it was just Facebook. You know, they don't realize there's all these other platforms. And so all of a sudden, this new associate with new ideas and new directions can help your practice grow in areas that maybe you weren't even touching it. It's a whole new energy level they can bring. That's exactly yeah. right. A whole new energy level and revitalization. Uh, going back to uh, never too early to start. So then I had this other conversation with another guy, has his small business, and he he has started. I talked about this offline with you and I. And, and that's what he's doing is he's bought two single family homes. I know you say that's the best investment. We got to start somewhere. So he's a good investment. Don't get me wrong. They're just more labor intensive than, than. Yeah. So, so he's bought two of them, you know, and both of them were kind of uh, one of them. I think he bought two years ago, maybe three. And then, then he just bought one towards the end of last year, kind of a neighbor and yada, 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 got a good deal and yada, yada, yada. And, and so now he's got two rental properties, let's call them, but, but they're also decent houses. Right. Um, and he's, and he's making a thousand a month, roughly, you know, maybe it's 1200, 800, but it's a thousand a piece. So $2,000 in free cash flow on top of the mortgage and taxes and insurance. Right. Yeah. And like you were saying, so he started his pillars. He started his pillars. He said, look, if I buy another eight, you know, one a year over the next 10 years, eight years, so that I'd have 10 of these, that's 10,000 a month, just doing simple math, each one a thousand a month positive cash flow. In 10 years, I'll have 10 pieces of property with a thousand cash flow. That's 10,000 of positive cash flow. That would be a great retirement. You and I were talking about offline. Yeah, don't forget, you'll probably get some rental rate increases, right? So it'd be more plus. I didn't even talk about this, like you were saying, that the house itself could be worth more than what, what it was 10 years ago. Obviously, you think it would be. And I'm going to add to this right now. Okay, you, you, let's say you bought those 10. So 10 years from now, they're cash flowing at a thousand a month. And they've appreciated now for 10 years, maybe double. Yeah. In fact, a lot of times they do double. It's about 7% yeah. a year for them to double. So all of a sudden they've doubled in value. And guess what you can do now? You can refinance all of them and take all of your cash out tax free because you don't pay tax on borrowed money. That's right. So now you can take the borrowed money and go do that again and then refinance those. I mean, this is a... I don't want to downplay single family homes because this is how a lot of people have built wealth in single family homes. Exactly. Right. It's just, they go they, back to him. He was so, so what he was talking about, because he has a, a single person uh, uh, law practice okay. and he was like, what is your plan? Are you going to bring on an associate? This is where this all comes. Are you going to bring on an associate? Are you going to do that? He's like, no, I'll probably just run it into the ground, you know, just do my thing. And he's got a paralegal, just do my little thing, hurdle, run it into the ground, work until I'm 70 or whatever it is. But these rental houses will be my little thing. Plus, he is saving money. He's not spending what he's making uh, as the single lawyer. So never too early to start. He started this three years ago, four years ago. He's got a little bit of a plan, whether it works exactly as a or not. It's a plan, and his plan is he'll at least have three of the four. Well, I guess he'll have all four because he's got his little business that's generating income, that's generating excess income, that he's bought two rental properties hopes to buy more. He's got a retirement plan. So he keeps doing that. And then there's a little bit of money that's being left over because he's not, you know, even the 2000 a month he doesn't spend puts that over here in the wealth accumulation account. So he has started. And, and in his scenario, he does not have to sell his practice, his law practice to make retirement work for him because the other three pillars, you know, I would have encouraged him that, you know, you and I would coach him. Hey, like we just said, bring on an associate and you can grow your business and get better at marketing. You can grow your business. He's like, no, 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 I even simpler than that. I just do what I'm doing. I run it into the ground and I do the other four pillars. Three and pillars. he's being smart. There's nothing wrong. Here's why I say he's being smart. Because look, the, the reality is the goal is to get to the fourth pillar. When yeah. you have the fourth pillar and the second and third are in place, the idea is to transition out of the business anyway. Yeah. And so I, um, I, I think it's Robert Kiyosaki I was listening to uh, one time and he had said that um, he builds the four pillars, by the way, but it was, it was like 20 years in the business. And okay. in the 20th year, his income equaled all that he made in the first 20 because he was able to refinance, take all this cash out. And he did that a couple of times over the, and, and literally, and would invest half the cash and then he'd keep half of it to live on. And he was constantly living off borrowed money, which is a great tax strategy. Um, 
but it does keep you leveraged. Uh, so you're not, but it was in that 20th year. So when you implement this strategy, it the fourth pillar, uh, and this is a reality to the fourth <laughs> pillar. The fourth pillar, a lot of people start implementing the fourth pillar in their 60 to 70s. They're, okay. you know, they're getting up there in age and it's like, okay, I've got all this money now. Um, now what do I do with it? Well, they're going to go make more money. I'm going to start investing. I'm going to buy some stocks over here. Maybe I'll invest in this um, this new startup where I'll buy my competitor out or, you know, so a lot of times it's, you've implemented the other three pillars so well that it's now, Hey, I, I really have got this other area. I, all this extra money I can now invest and really, really start kicking the four pillars into high gear. But a lot of times it's later in life. Um, some people don't go to the real estate till later in life and they're like, why right. did I wait so long? So, uh, sorry, that's, a uh, um, I should have had my phone on do not disturb. But uh, no, but that's a great point. And, and I think that's also how the world works. I think things happen exponentially, right? As you, if you think about, you know, I, I, we can talk about anything when you're younger, you don't have a lot of money and you got wife and kids. And then all of a sudden the kids move out. And then it's like that last 10 to 15 years. It's like, you know, you and your spouse, your kids are out, you know, there, there's, there's, there's an ex, your house may or may not be paid for if you've done it right. So there's this exponential earnings. They talk about it, exponential earnings. They talk about it when they talk about people in financial planning, that it's like the last 10 or 15 years, there's a lot of income that you're saving just because your expenses have gone down in, in theory. Same thing for any kind of business owner, you're exactly right would be if you're doing it right the last little bit, maybe you didn't get all your money or start doing your real estate through your 50 or 60. You could, like I said, you could, the earlier, the earlier you start, the better, right? The oak tree 10 years ago, the next best time is the day. So never we're just trying to get, start. Never, never too, too early. early. And, and yeah. this is, this goes into, especially the third pillar. Um, you want as much time between you and the day you retire. When you start funding your retirement funds, yeah. If you do that, if you go to college and you do that fresh out of college and the entire time you work, great. If you start working at 16 years old as a dishwasher and you start then, even better. But, you know, I don't think we have a lot of 16-year-olds watching our show or, or listening to our podcast. But, but but you could do it for your 16-year-old kid, right? So if they got a summer job, you could put money in a, in a Roth IRA for them. And however much money they make up to $6,000, you can put $6,000 into a Roth IRA for your kid, as long as they earn six thousand bucks, you could put six thousand in, in in a regular IRA. Either way, there's this whole thing. You go Google it. It's like if you did six thousand a year from the time you were sixteen to five. It's like you'll have a ton of money by the time they retire, right? So yeah. you could do your kids a favor as a business owner and just match whatever their summer jobs earning are and put that money in a Roth IRA for them, and you're doing them a huge favor because you're starting to save for them at 16, 18, 20 years old. Yeah, because and if you, the index, time. index funds, you, you could you get what over 50 years, it could be an 8% return on average. Yeah, you, you and, I mean, Google compound return. Yeah, I'm not giving investment 50. advice, but, but yeah, yeah. I know we're, I'm, I'm, yeah, we should. I know, but I'm trying to sell them. Yeah, but you can do your kids a favor, start investing early, and you could go Google it. How much would it be worth? Yada, yada, yada. If I started my kids 16 to 21 when they went to school, you know, they go to high school and college, and you match their summer earnings every year and put that money in a Roth. How much is it worth when they're 65? It's a bunch of money, you, but, but Google it because this isn't a financial advice show. But <laughs> yeah, we got to be careful, right? And so that's, yeah. the, that's the legal stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. But you're exactly right. You can do that for them and start her because you're exactly right. The, 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 that retirement portion, the earlier you start, the better. Uh, and especially there are a lot of years, like I said, when you can do it when they're younger, when you know they don't need the money because they're not, they're still. They're not buying cars and apartments and houses because they're still, you know, teenagers or in college or whatever. Well, the best thing, though, I, I mean, I taught both my kids. Um, I could do it for you, but I'm not going to. You're got to do this. And and both of them, I was very surprised to hear my daughter. The other, she's been working at a restaurant, graduated college, but still working at a restaurant. Now she's working in her career. She got a, she got a job in sales and marketing. She has a minor in marketing. But um when she told me how much she had saved, she literally saved about 20% of her income as a waitress at an upscale restaurant. And I was like, first of all, she owns her car. Yeah. She, um, you know, so she's got all this cash. I'm like, holy, I mean, <laughs> it amazes you as a parent when your kids listen 
She had a like a 20 percent of her income for eighteen months. She saved it, and that's and awesome. Probably more than twenty percent. It was a big number, and I was like, "Wow, that's awesome!" Now you're stepping into your career, and as you establish yourself, when it comes time to buy a house or invest, you now have money. That granted, if you invest, you may lose money. But and I told her what you need to do is. I don't care who you go talk to, go talk to a, an investment advisor and start building a retirement fund. I That's know good. it doesn't sound like, but you're in your 20s, build it now. Get some life insurance now, you know, because it's cheap now when you're young and get a permanent policy. I know there's, a, now I'm not giving you investment right. advice, but it's right. my kid. Get something that's yeah. small, that's permanent so that you, after a period of time, it's already paid for and I know there's the, the buy term and reinvest the difference. There's those people. But if you're if you're young, you can buy a very small policy and you and it's real cheap, but it's permanent. It's there your whole life. You never have to worry about it. And it, by the time yeah, you're yeah. like 40, it's already paid for and you'd never have to pay in it into it again. It'll cash for it. But you awesome. have a, like a you have an opinion on that probably that maybe well, not I, I like I'm the term and invest the rest. That's what I am. There's a, there's a, or, or both. I, I like whole life and term, you know, because I think investor, because the point also, or insurance is also like car insurance, which is like, it's only in case you didn't make, if you're successful and you made it, you really don't need any insurance, right? The insurance yeah, is if part, you, yeah. yeah, the insurance is if you died when you're 35 and you got two kids and a wife, you know, a spouse and you got to take care of them. But if you're 60 and you've made it, you really don't need any. You don't. Yeah, at that point. And I do. I have a big term policy. Why? Because I have businesses and I invest in real estate. And yeah. that's why you have a term policy. Term is a lot cheaper than than a whole life or variable life, you know, yeah. but. Um, or do a combo of the two, like yeah. you're saying, which I'm not opposed to that either. Because yeah. you borrow against those, like you can borrow against real estate, tax free money, all that kind of jazz. Yeah. So, so that's kind of, all right, this is pretty good. So uh, never too early to start, right? The oak tree 10 years ago, the next best time is today, right? So we talked about our four pillars. We gave several examples of people who are, are starting earlier or just starting today or just starting a five-year plan today for their four pillars strategy, right? Never too early to start. These are the kind of things that you and I talk about in our mastermind group. And the idea being is, you know, the guy never thought about it until he went to go. Somebody made an offer to, to, to buy his business, right? He never even thought about the four pillars until, oh gosh, I wish I did have all the, you know, a piece of real estate that generated income and big retirement can that I can, and some investment money that I could, gosh, I'm not going to be able to live off of just my business sale, right? But he just had thought about it. Now that he's thought about it, he understands the concept of the four pillars. The more you understand the four pillars and start the four pillars earlier, the better off we are. This is what we talk about in our mastermind group. Matt at ProfitabilityMD.com, Dave at ProfitabilityMD.com. Uh, you're around peers. That, that This is the kind of stuff we talk about. It gets you to think about it before. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, right. Our irresistible offer is that profit acceler acceleration session. Uh, find any business owner, $50,000, $75,000, $100,000, without spending a dollar more in advertising and marketing. Uh, the idea there is we can find you money to kickstart your four pillars using our profit acceleration session. So Matt at Profitability, Dave at Profitability. We got our YouTube channel, Profitability MD. Go to YouTube and Profitability MD. We got this podcast and we got profitability.com anywhere you find us. So we're pretty much all over the place. So this is good stuff. Episode 165, Dave. All right, Matt. Have a great afternoon. All right, buddy. All right, bye.